Welcome to Russian History Retold, Episode 125, The Rebellion of Stenka Razin. The piece of music I hope you just enjoyed was from the Nutcracker Suite, Act 1, Number 2, by Peter Tchaikovsky, also known as The March. Last time, we recounted the tale of the first major rebellion of the 17th century, led by Ivan Bolotnikov. This week, we will move ahead in time some 63 years later to the year 1670 and the revolt led by a person who has one of the best names in Russian history, in my humble opinion, one Stenka Razin. While the Bolotnikov Rebellion had been put down brutally, Russia was still inching its way out of the time of troubles. With Michael Romanov in charge, there came a sense of stability returning to Moscow, but the South was still for the most part lawless. Roving bands of brigands, sometimes Cossacks, sometimes just bands of marauders, attacked traveling merchants and pretty much anyone who crossed their paths. The government, weak as it was, could do little to stop them. On top of it, many of the poor peasants would shelter the men and return for protection, alerting them if government forces were coming. In Moscow, Tsar Mikhail Romanov, or should I say his advisory team, led by his father, Metropolitan Filaret, was stabilizing the central government. But one glaring problem was not being dealt with, and that was the underlying issues that led to the Bolitnikov Rebellion. Instead, they increased the subjugation of the people. After Tsar Michael died in 1645, his son Alexis took over and created the Law Code of 1649. It essentially divided the whole of Russian society into a stratified order. As my former professor, Paul Average, put it in his book, Russian Rebels, 1600 to 1800, quote, Peasants were tied to the land, and townsmen were frozen into the occupations of their fathers, and forbidden on penalty of death to move to new locations. This was not done only to ensure an uninterrupted flow of tax revenue into the treasury, but to halt the perpetual wandering of the people, which grievously undermined social stability. For the same reasons, the state removed any time limit for the recovery of runaway peasants and imposed heavy penalties on landlords guilty of harboring them. Obviously, the peasant class was devastated once again. Lost was any hope for a better future. Another class, though, that was pretty much done for but didn't know it yet were the boyars. They were rendered useless, unless, of course, they still held land. It was the landowner, or the service gentry, who now became the most dominant person that the Tsar could turn to in a crisis. The Tsar relied on them for much of his finances and soldiers. The now powerful service gentry class put that burden on their serfs. And at this point, I'm going to have to semi-abandon the term serfdom and call it what it is, slavery. Any slave or townsperson who wanted to leave this horrible situation, as I said before, did so under penalty of death. Even with this threat, people still tried to flee, with entire villages leaving after sometimes killing the master and town leaders. This became especially true with the start of war with Poland in 1654, then the ensuing war with Sweden that started shortly thereafter. Because of this drain of field slaves, the Crown decided to, become, to begin recovery operations starting in 1658. They sent out armed search parties to bring back the fugitives. In 1662, 5,000 slaves were rounded up in the middle Volga region, and three years later, 3,000 were captured in the Tobov region. Both of these areas were to be strongholds for the Razin-led rebellion. No matter the punishment given, typically beatings with a knout, which is kind of a knotted rope, peasants kept fleeing their bondage. What is interesting is this was not just a Russian phenomenon. It was occurring throughout Europe. Countries like France, Hungary, and Portugal, to name a few, saw uprisings. From the Atlantic to the Ural Mountains, the social climate was tense. As an English preacher called it during the Puritan Revolution in England, these are days of shaking. Many in the countryside and towns believed that the end times were upon them. 
In Russia, many believe that Patriarch Nikon, with his hated reforms, was the Antichrist, and Tsar Alexis was the beast of the apocalypse. No longer did many view the Tsar as the Badushka, or father of the people. As the Russian historian Platonov wrote about how the people were feeling about the Tsar, quote, The sovereign is a young fool and looks on everything through the eyes of the boyars, Morosov, Miloslavsky. They dominate everything and the Tsar. Though he knows what is going on, he keeps quiet, for the devil has taken away his understanding. With war on the Western Front waging, you would think that the government would try to slow down a little bit with their expansion east towards Siberia or the south. Problem is, you would be wrong. This caused the government to increase taxes, leading to a riot in Moscow in 1648 when the salt tax was quadrupled. Town after town, like the normally passive cities, like Ustyug, Yaroslav, Peskov, and Novgorod, exploded in anger. Then, the government, seeing that there still wasn't enough money, began to debase the currency by minting copper coins instead of the silver-based ones. Inflation skyrocketed, as one would expect. Hoarding of silver by the well-off began to compound the problem. In Kolomenskoy, a massive riot broke out. Troops were sent in, and a massacre ensued. 7,000 people were killed many more injured, and thousands banished to the middle and lower Volga region. These were to become loyal and eager recruits for the upcoming Razin revolt as well. By the end of the war with Poland in 1667, almost one-fifth of the Russian population had died in the war or because of famine and plague. The country was a tinderbox waiting to explode. All it needed was a little spark a messiah-like figure to light the fuse. They would get it in 1670 in the charismatic leader Stenka Razin. In the middle to lower Volga region, you have the people known as the Don Cossacks. They were wildly libertarian in nature, refusing to pay taxes to Moscow, and indeed expecting to be paid by the Muscovite government for patrolling the borders and thereby protecting Moscow, and other cities of the interior of Russia. They were paid an annual subsidy known as Shalovny. It was paid in food, money, and military supplies. Every once in a while, emissaries from the Cossack Center in Cherkask would head to Moscow to negotiate the size of the payment. What the leadership of the Cossacks was worried about was the advancing agricultural farms, which they feared would end their way of life. They banned farming in their area as they believed it would lead to their enslavement as serfs. It would also bring an end to the libertarian and free-natured way of life they had led for many years. They were really fighting an uphill battle, especially with the thousands upon thousands of runaway peasants flowing into the region, many of whom only knew farming, their only way of surviving. By 1670, the population of the region had tripled in size since the Code of 1649 was introduced. Resentment among the new inhabitants against the old house-owning Cossacks was growing. The older Cossacks were known as downstream Cossacks, which was kind of like minor nobility. They would throw their hat in with the forces of the Tsar when push came to shove. Much like Klopko had started a small rebellion prior to Bolotnikov's, so too did Razin have a foretelling revolt come before his. In the summer of 1666, a Cossack named Vaska Us began to gather men to march on Moscow to demand payment of the Zhulovny in return for service to the Tsar. Starting with 500 men, Us headed first to Voronezh, then to Bolotnikov's former stronghold of Tula. By the time he reached there, his force had grown to 2,000 strong. The Voivoda, or the leader as he was known in that day, called on Moscow to send aid to his garrison at Tula. Quickly, a large force was dispatched, headed by Prince Yuri Baratininsky. As the troops got closer to the rebels, they scattered and left the area, dispersing to their former homes. This, though, would not be the last we would hear of Vaska Us. While Us was a fair to middling leader, 
he was no match for the extremely charismatic Ottoman leader Stepan Tomofeyevich Razin. Born to an old Cossack family of means, Razin was a loyal member of the establishment. His godfather, Kornilo Yakolev, was the Voiskovoy Adaman, a top leader of the Don Cossacks. We first learn of Razin in 1652, when he was about 21, when he made his first pilgrimage to the Solovetsky Monastery on the White Sea, heading through Moscow. Next, he comes up as a part of the Cossack delegation in 1658 to negotiate the annual tribute. He also fought against the Crimean Tatars for the Tsar in 1663. As Professor Average puts it in his book, quote, Throughout history, rebel leaders have come from comfortable backgrounds. Indeed, this would seem more the rule than the exception. Seldom have the oppressed themselves led the way, but rather those who have been aroused by their suffering and their degradation. So why would a man of means lead a rebellion to help the oppressed the masses of which he was not? Now, some of it suggested, and this was in a couple books I read, which was kind of disturbing because they really didn't check this out very well. There's a few books on Russian history where this incident is reported as fact when actually we may not believe that. Uh, some have suggested that he was angered by the execution of an older brother by Prince Yuri Dolgeruki, much like Lenin centuries later when his older brother was executed by the Tsar. The only problem is that we have no evidence that Stenka had an older brother. His motivation is likely to have come happenstance, starting with brigandage and a series of raids against Persia and the Turks in the Caspian Sea. From early 1667 through the summer of 1669, Stenka Razin led a band of Cossacks on raids against the villages down the Volga River, past Astrahan, and into the Caspian Sea. Moscow heard of it and sent messages to the local voivodas to stop him. Being fiercely independent, the Cossack leaders, including his godfather, ignored the orders. Moscow was enjoying improved trade with Persia and the Ottoman Empire and did not want to endanger the lucrative business with their neighbors to the south. Town after town, Razin and his men, using fear or trickery, were able to get into the fortified cities and gain more followers. Many of the Streltsy, old-time protectors of Moscow from the time of Ivan the Terrible, joined Stenka's band instead of fighting them. Oftentimes, if the Voivodas resisted, their Streltsy would revolt and kill them and their officers. As they passed the heavily fortified city of Tsaritsyn, the guns there went silent, with the Voivoda either afraid or unwilling to fire on the now burgeoning flotilla of ships. This reluctance helped Razin gain a mythical quality about his invincibility. They then attacked the fortress city of Yatsk. Instead of a frontal assault, assault, 40 of his men snuck in, asking to pray at the cathedral. Once in, they opened the gates, letting in their comrades. Any of the Streltsy who refused to join the rebels were slaughtered. About 170 men were killed, with Razin's men suffering no casualties. Stenka decided to winter in Yatsk, where he repulsed numerous attacks by Tsarist forces. Tsar Alexis even offered a general amnesty if they stopped their raids. The messenger was arrested and drowned. In 1669, they began their raids on the Caspian seaports, attacking both Persian and Turkish holdings, as well as attacking any seagoing merchant vessels. They had a number of battles with Persian fleets, but Razin's boats, known as Strugi, were too fast and powerful. By late summer, weary and full of plunder, they began to head back to the Don. Unfortunately for Razin, as they approached the mouth of the Volga and the city of Astrahan, they were met by a large fleet of Russian warships led by Prince Simeon Livov. Tired and low on provisions, Stenka's men were in no fighting shape, so when an offer of a full pardon in return for abandoning his booty and the return of all prisoners they gathered in previous raids, along the Volga especially, Razin accepted the offer. He actually had no intention of carrying out his side of the bargain, but he didn't let on.
This flotilla of ships entered the Astrahan harbor and were greeted as conquering heroes by the inhabitants. Prince Lvov even invited Razin to his home for dinner, where the two men actually befriended each other. His legend kept growing. When Stenka reneged on his vow, no one called him on it. The voivoda of Astrahan, Prozorovsky, knew he was powerless to enforce the agreement, given that his own Streltsy were sympathetic to Razin and his men. They decided to winter in Kagolnik, an island village near the Cossack main headquarters in Cherkask. The Cossack elders were now feeling threatened by Stenka and his now burgeoning army. While starting out as a shaika, or pirate band, only interested in plunder, Razin's movement was starting to transform into a voisko, or rebel army. The men, and interestingly enough women who joined his camp, were the disenfranchised and poor. So what started out as a raid for wealth and booty was transforming itself as well as Stenka Razin into a social movement. It was at this point that the leader of this band of brigands decided to march on Moscow. Hearing this, the Tsar sent another emissary to Razin's godfather, Yakovlev, demanding he stop Stenka. Yakovlev, feeling threatened, called a meeting of his top people known as a Krug. The Tsar's man, Gerasim Ivdokumov, attended the Krug, which was crashed by Stenka and his men. If Dokomov was beaten to death after Razin shouted him, Who sent you? The great sovereign or the boyars? A number of Cossack elders met a similar fate. Yakolov was threatened so well, so he backed off. By March of 1670, Razin's army, now over 7,000 strong, began to march up the Volga. Near the town of Panshin, he would make a dramatic speech that would mark the start of the rebellion. Quote, to go from the Don to the Volga, and from the Volga into Rus against the sovereign's enemies and betrayers, and to remove from the Muscovite state the traitor boyars and Duma men and the voivodas and officials in the towns, and to give freedom to the common people. I will not raise my sword against the great sovereign. I would rather cut off my own head with it or be drowned in the river. We are ready to serve and die for the house of the Blessed Virgin and for the great sovereign. But the boyars have barred our way to the sea in the Volga, and we have thus become naked and hungry. And now we shall get to the Volga against the boyars and the voivodas, so that the boyars and the voivodas do not starve us to death. The force of men headed to Tsurisin, where they spread rumors that a czarist army was not being sent to protect the people, but to punish them for their aid to Razin a few years before. Scared of the potential reprisal, the townspeople opened the gates and allowed the insurgents in. The lie worked. A small band of loyalists barricaded themselves in a watchtower, but were eventually vanquished and killed, along with the new voivoda, Timofey Turgenev. News came of the approaching Tsarist regiment of Streltsy, led by Ivan Lopatin, who did not know that the Tsaritsyn had fallen already. Fierce fighting ensued, with the Streltsy making it to the city, where they were horrified to discover that instead of becoming a place of shelter, it became their place to die. Only a few survived of the 400 who entered the city. The only ones to live were those who pledged to join Razin's rebels. Another Krug, this one led by Stenka, was held where fierce debate ensued as to where to head to next, go back toward Astrahan and gather more troops and consolidate their gains, or head straight to Moscow. In one of those deciding moments in history, they chose to head back south. Many historians view this as the one fatal mistake made by Razin. By not heading north, they gave Tsar Alexis and his men time to gather their forces and regroup. The next two rebellions led by Bulavin and Pugachev would make similar disastrous decisions. Alexis made full use of this time out. He asked for help from the Kalmyk tribesmen, longtime enemies of the Cossacks. The Tsar also ordered that all border towns halt the stream of people headed to Razin's aid. While slowing it down considerably, it could not and did not stop the peasants from joining the growing band of rebels. <laughs> 
Now, as an aside, during Alexis's reign, he was dramatically modernizing and increasing the size of his army, something his son Peter the Great would follow up with vigorously. What Razin would face was a standing army of about 100,000 men, all told, up from the standing army of 50,000 when Alexis took control. Still, Stenka Razin's army was no small and inconsequential force. They had the south, along with the sympathy of the populace. Astrahan was now the focus of the rebel army. The voivoda Ivan Prozorovsky sent an army of 2,600 Strelsi, led by her old friend Prince Lvov, against Razin. Unfortunately for Lvov, his men refused to fight, arrested their commander, and turned over their officers to Stenka's men. Lvov was spared for now because of his friendship with Razin. Another officer, Ludwig Fabricius, escaped to tell the tale of what happened in Astrahan. Razin feigned an assault on the main gate of the city, instead using treachery and rumors that they might fall victim to general pillaging of the town. They entered from the rear through an opened gate. Panic ensued to the point of the defenders killing their own officers. From here, an orgy of blood and looting took place, with anyone suspected of being well off in mortal danger. Over 440 were killed, but it could have been far worse, except for Stenka Razin stopping the carnage. The town was filled with foreign merchants, many of whom felt the rebels' wrath. Moscow's window on the east, Astrahan, was fully in the insurgents' hands. Razin left town, which gave the green light for more murder and mayhem. Prince Lvov and the Metropolitan were murdered, with the wives and daughters of the merchants being taken and raped. Stenka Razin and his 6,000-man army made its way up the Volga, finally heading towards Moscow. Again, towns on the way joined the rebel cause. Anyone of any standing either fled in horror or summarily executed. Many tribes like the Mordva, Mari, Shuvash joined in the frenzy. Those who were traditional rivals of the Cossacks, like the Kalmyks and many Tatars, stayed loyal to the Tsar. One group which on the surface became an unlikely ally of the rebels was the lower clergy of the Russian Orthodox Church. But was it really a surprise given the animosity between the powers that be, like the bishops and metropolitans, and the lay clergy? Not really, considering many of the lower-level priests were still old believers, or at least sympathizers. By the late summer of 1670, the rebels held an 800-mile-long swath of land, including the towns of Astrahan, Cherny, Yar, Tsaritsyn, Saratov, and Samara. The Tsar had had enough. He sent a pair of large detachments of mostly cavalry, one led by Prince Yuri Dolgoruki, and the second by Prince Yuri Baratinsky. Baratinsky was to head to the town of Simbirsk to hold the rebels there. Simbirsk was the town where a few hundred years later the most successful rebel leader in Russian history would be born, Vladimir Lenin. The cavalry met the invading insurgent army head-on, but lacking a strong infantry, they were forced to retreat, opening the way for Razin's army to lay siege to the city. They made it through the outer defenses easily, but the inner walls, uh, they would prove a major obstacle. Here, the whole rebellion would face a major turning point. Inexplicably, during the month-long siege, Razin sent out multiple raiding parties to the outlying countryside instead of concentrating his forces on Simbirsk. Three separate attacks, mostly at night, failed to breach the inner walls. It has been speculated that had Stenka captured Simbirsk, Kazan and Nizhny Novgorod would have been ripe for the taking, with Moscow being left alone and highly vulnerable. The rebel detachments, led by Miska Karatonov, Vasha Fedorov, and Maxim Osipov, ravaged town after town, leaving them in ruins, killing many voivodas and slaughtering the local nobility. But as fall approached, Baryatinsky's forces made their way to Simbirsk and faced off against Stenka Razin's ragtag band of peasants and Cossacks. The battle that ensued was fierce, but terribly one-sided. Facing cannons with axes and pitchforks, 
the rebels were mowed down en masse, with Razin himself suffering multiple wounds to the head and legs. Baryatinsky wasn't done. He pursued the insurgents with his cavalry and artillery. Those who weren't killed by the fierce gunfire were captured and executed, or drowned in the river Sviaga. The rout was in full force. Prince Dolgeruki was advancing on rebel holdings on the Volga, and Prince Grigory Robinodovsky taking on the insurgents on the Don. More than 60,000 Tsarist troops, freshly recruited and trained, bore down on the rebels. The reason so many new soldiers were now available was that the Russo-Polish War had ended and hostilities had ceased. Maxim Osipov was now the target of Dolgeruki's army, whose detachments led by the gifted officers Fyodor Leontiev and Prince Konstantin Shishurbatov chased him and his men down near Nizhny Novgorod. The two-day battle that ensued, starting on October 22nd, was another slaughter. Those who surrendered were either hung or beheaded. The Tsarist forces were as merciful to the rebels as they had been to their enemies. Frolka Razin, Stenka's brother, tried to besiege the town of Tambov, but was met by the relieving army of Romodonovsky. Both armies suffered staggering losses, but the better armed and disciplined Muscovite forces, which also outnumbered the rebels three to one, prevailed. The slaughter of the insurgent forces was brutal. Many were, quote, impaled on stakes, nailed to boards, torn to shreds by flesh hooks, and flogged or strangled to death. Throughout the main theaters of the uprising, public hanging, quartering, disemboweling, beheading, and breaking on the wheel went on for months. The government, now enduring two major rebellions during the past 70 years, thought that this time, this brutal lesson would prevent future rebellions. That just didn't happen the way they hoped for. The people were still being treated miserably, and the vast majority of the citizens of Russia felt that their lot in life was going to continue to be worth the potential retribution from the Muscovite regime. But where was Stenka Razin? He was in the field trying to rouse new recruits in Cherkask. His fatal mistake here was to threaten his godfather, Cornelio Lakovlev, who by now had had enough. On April 14, 1671, his men captured his godson and his brother and put them in irons. At the town of Serpukhov, about 20 miles outside of Moscow, the brothers were turned over to the soldiers of the Tsarist army. The Don Cossacks lost a lot of their autonomy because of Razin's rebellion, the exact opposite of its intent. Almost all of the Cossack fortresses, but one, was destroyed. Razin, for his part, was horribly tortured, with Tsar Alexis personally interrogating him at length. Taking the torture without complaint, Stenka Razin was executed on June 6, 1671. His mother and an uncle were also executed by the order of the Tsar for their part in leading the rebellion. In August of 1671, the Don Cossacks swore fealty to the Tsar. Ironically, had Razin's rebellion not occurred, this event would have likely been delayed for many decades. Astrahan, though, was still in rebel hands, led by her old friend Vaska Us. Prince Ivan Miloslavsky led 30,000 men to crush the final embers of the rebellion. By the winter of 1671, it was all over. Us, who started it all off, was the last to die when it ended. As Russia, under the guidance of Tsar Alexis, drew closer to Western Europe, the traditional Russian peasant increased their resistance. With more European immigrants coming into the country, the conservative Russians fought back, yearning for some mythical good old days. As bad as they thought it was under Alexis, who many thought was the Antichrist, his son Peter would be in the peasant's eyes the Antichrist on steroids. And just as a little social comment here, and I hope it doesn't rile too many people up, this is very similar to some of the things that we're seeing today in Europe and the United States. We're very ultra-conservatives who are very disturbed by immigrants coming in, and they don't want to change the ways of the world. They want to go back to some mythical good old days, which really weren't all that great after all, if we really be honest about it. But this was something that the peasants would 
dream about, about the good czar that was there, the good czar that never was. Next time, Peter the Great's reforms and westernization policies would lead to the Third Great Rebellion. It was the smallest of the four, but was the most dangerous to the sitting czar because of its timing. Join me then to recount the story of the rebellion led by Kondrati Bulavin. Well, I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Another reminder, I'm blogging at my site at www.russianrulershistory.com about the dozen seminal moments in Russian history that changed everything. Please visit it when you can and sign up for the updates or make a donation, big or small, to help keep the podcast going. Also, if you have a moment, could you please rate the podcast on iTunes? It really helps to boost its ranking and get more listeners. And also, join us on Facebook as well, where you can ask a question, leave a message, or make a suggestion. So as always, Das Vidanya и спасибо большое.